on to section 2.4, the action of a group on a set. Uh, this overlaps with uh, the Fraley book I like so much. Uh, this contains much of the same material that Fraley's section 3.17 contains. Um, our main motivation in going through this topic really is so we can look at uh, proofs of the CELO theorems that we'll see in section 2.5. Uh, we will have one uh, result I think is interesting called Cayley's theorem, and we'll get that we'll get to that point in uh, this video. So, plan is to define the action of a group on a set S. So, this lives in the realm of algebra since it involves groups, but groups are interacting with sets in some uh, particular way. Uh, we'll put two constraints on this type of interaction. Now, quite often the sets themselves will be groups or subgroups of group G, uh, and the action will be described by the binary operation in the group or something related to that. So we start with a group G and a set S and a function that maps the Cartesian product of G and S into set S. So this takes an ordered pair, G comma X, G coming from the group, X coming from the set, it's the standard symbols that we'll use. And this is mapped to what I will denote as G star X. So this is group element G acting on set element X, such that we require for all X in the set and all G1 and G2 in the group, that we have the identity X on X <coughs> to give X back out. <coughs> again, for all X and S. So group action by the identity element um, is, if we're dealing with groups, uh, we'll be able to use the binary operation to produce this, but not a surprising constraint on how the identity behaves. And we require that G1 times G2 acting on X. Okay, a uh, quick little comment here. I see uh, two things. One of them is the binary operation from group G where we're multiplying G1 times G2. And the other one is this action thing that we're in the middle of defining. So we're taking the product G1, G2 and group G, letting it act on X and requiring that that equal G1 acting on the result of G2 acting on X, a sort of associativity type thing. So by definition, when we say group action, this is what we mean. It'll require this, it'll uh, satisfy this first property and this second property. We say that G acts on set S. Uh, it's an example of group action. About the star, that's my doings. Hungerford denotes the action of a group element G on a set element X simply as G times X. This seems to be common. That's how Fraley does it. Dummett and Foote in their um, algebra book, kind of a competitor to Hungerford, they, they denote this uh, simply as GX as well. I'm going to use a star. So I've written up the notes for this section. Uh, when it comes up in the future, probably in 2.5, uh, I'll use stars to indicate the group action. There is room for uh, confusion because sometimes when we have groups, set X is actually a set of group elements. Sometimes the action will be simply the binary operation. And sometimes the binary operation will make sense, but the group action will be a bit more complicated than that. When we see conjugation, it's a bit more complicated. So I find it way easier to follow if I denote the group action with a little star but that's totally my doing, so you're not likely to see that out there elsewhere. All right, let's do some examples. Uh, one place you've already actually encountered this group action stuff is in the setting of symmetry groups, S sub n. The symmetry group S sub n, group of order n factorial, was the group of all permutations on the symbols one through n, permutations on the set I sub n of symbols one through n, which um, certainly is a room for confusion when you first encounter symmetry groups. The group elements are permutations. The numbers, they're not in the group, 
not in the symmetry groups, they're in some set, they're um, used to illustrate how the permutations interact. Well, the perfect place to explain it is here. We have then for a sigma, an element of S sub n, so it's a permutation on those symbols, and X, one of the symbols, X an element of set I sub n, uh, the mapping, we'll treat it as group action, take an ordered pair uh, from S sub n, Cartesian product with I sub n, so that would be a sigma uh, and an X, where X is one through n, one of those entries, and let sigma act on X simply by letting sigma uh, or denoting the result as sigma of X. It takes in X, one of those numbers, sigma's a permutation, so sigma gives out one of those numbers as well. So the cleanest way to describe what's going on with symmetry groups is actually in the lingo of group action. Uh, by the way, to further illustrate, uh, if we take the identity permutation, iota, let it act on X, the way we've just defined this group action, that's simply iota of X, and that's X itself because iota is the identity, so it satisfies that condition for all X in the set, I sub n. And if we take sigma one composed with sigma two and let that act on X, the binary operation is function composition. So we take sigma one composed with sigma two, that's just elaborating on what the binary operation is there. And then we've said, let the group action be applying this permutation in the parentheses to that set element X. So we'll take sigma one composed with sigma two and apply it to X. Definition of the binary operation, and definition of the group action in terms of applying permutations to these symbols. Well, that's just a composition of functions applied to an element. So that is sigma one of sigma two of X. Well, sigma two of X is simply sigma two acting on X because that's how we define the group, the group action. And then sigma one of that is sigma one acting on this thing here. Notice the thing in in parentheses, the highlighted quantity is one of the symbols one through n. So it satisfies the two conditions that a group action must satisfy and the symmetry group allows us to illustrate a way of uh, describing a group action. If we take subgroups of the symmetry groups like the alternating groups, alternating groups act on the symbols uh, in set I sub n. The dihedral groups, this one's a little trickier, acts on those symbols as well, but we need to interpret the one through n as um, vertices of a regular n-gon with the labels uh, to have some restriction on the structure so that we get a dihedral group. But again, can be thought of in terms of um, group actions. Now we're going to um, consider some examples based uh, entirely on groups. So all groups, uh, the sets will be sets of group elements in the next several examples. So let G be a group uh, and let H be a subgroup of G. Then we can treat group H as acting on set G. Okay, so like I said, we're taking the set to be the set of elements in group G. By defining um, the mapping of the Cartesian product H with G into set G as H acts on element X simply by taking a product in group G. So we use the binary operation to define a group action. Uh, we'd need to confirm it satisfies the um, two properties of a group action. Of course it does. Uh, if H is the identity uh, in subgroup H, it's the identity in group G as well. Uh, and we'd get the identity property to hold. And because the binary operation is associative in a group, then we get that second condition on the group action to hold as well, as stated. So this really is an example of group action. Uh, the action of uh, element H on group G as given here is called left translation. Uh, it's also, it's a permutation of group G. Uh, think of it as uh, if I had a little group and 
I wrote out a Cayley table, multiplication table for the little group. This uh, left translation stuff really just has us look at uh, a row of the Cayley table corresponding to group element H. Uh, so, of course, we get a permutation. We get all the entries in particular order uh, in that row of the Cayley table. If K is another subgroup of G and S is the set, this time a little more sophisticated, S is the set of all left cosets of K and G. Okay, we're still doing it with groups, but uh, not talking about elements of a group now, but talking about cosets. So we've got K is a subgroup of G, set is the set S is the set of all left cosets of K and G. Then we can let this other subgroup H act on the set of cosets S by left translation, given by H, an element of group capital H, acts on left coset XK by producing left coset HXK. So we're using the binary operation right there, as well as in the definition of left cosets, but we're defining um, the group action on a set of cosets. Uh, worthy to check to make sure um, things behave as they should. If we choose the identity in H, of course, we get that to hold. And uh, associativity again will justify that uh, this actually does satisfy the two conditions of a group action and gives us an example. Okay. Uh, the following is really my main reason for introducing the star to represent group action. We're going to use conjugation uh, as a group action. And conjugation is based on binary operations. And without the stars, I think it just looks kind of difficult, ambiguous uh, to follow what's going on. So we'll take H as a subgroup of G, an action of H on set G, treating the elements of group G is elements of the set. It's given by the mapping that takes ordered pairs into group G by defining H acting on X, X coming from group G, as H, X, H inverse. So we're using the binary operation, but um, more than once. The awkwardness in Hungerford is Hungerford will denote this group action simply as HX. And this, of course, is denoted as HXH inverse. And then that, I don't like that. Uh, writing HX equals HXH inverse. And if you're really careful with um, the setting, you can see that this really represents an ordered pair over here, or the image of an ordered pair. Uh, but that's what inspires me to introduce the stars. So anyhow, H acts on element X in this way. We're using the binary operation. We're good. Everything's happening uh, in terms of this right-hand side inside group G. So binary operations are on a table. The identity acts on X in the form uh, identity X, identity inverse. Of course, that equals X for all X in set S, all X in the group. So we get the first condition of a group action satisfied. Secondly, we want G1, G2, multiplying those together in group G to act on element X in such a way that we get far right-hand side, G1 acting on the result of G2 acting on X. So we want this kind of behavior. Let's go through the quickie little computation. How does G1, G2 act on element X? Multiply on the left by G1, G2, and on the right by its inverse, the inverse of G1, G2, which is G2 inverse, G1 inverse, as you know. And then we can do some association. So associate the inner three, G2, X, G2 inverse. Well, that's how G2 acts on X. So uh, here appears a G2 acting on X. That's been conjugated by G1. Well, that's the action of G1 then on this quantity in parentheses. And indeed we get G1 acting on the result of G2 acting on X. Uh, this action is called conjugation by element H. 
the HXH inverse is called a conjugate or, or a conjugate of X uh, based on H. Uh, if K is any subgroup of G and we take H from subgroup H, then we can apply this conjugation process to subgroups as well. HKH inverse in this setting is a subgroup of G as well. It's isomorphic to H, something established in one of the exercises in our past in chapter one. But if you take a conjugate of a, um, of a subgroup, uh, you get another subgroup and it satisfies this isomorphism property. That's the claim of the exercise. So we can let H act on the set S of all subgroups of G. So the sets become subgroups of G as long as we can satisfy those two conditions in the definition of group action, and we can, let H act on K to uh, give the conjugate of K with respect to H, H capital K, H inverse. Uh, it's an argument, uh, same, same idea as what we have up here, uh, or sorry, uh, it's a, an example of group action by the same argument we have up here. Up here, we've dealt with it um, element-wise as opposed to group-wise, but we, we get the necessary two parts of the definition of group action satisfied. Uh, and group HKH inverse is said to be conjugate to group K. Uh, group conjugation is something we'll use somewhat. Okay, so uh, there's definitions of group action and some examples. Here's a <clears throat> first properties of group action. Theorem 2.4.2, uh, proof left as an exercise, as Hungerford says. It says let G be a group that acts on a set S. The relation on set S defined by X is related to X prime if and only if G acting on X gives X prime for some G in group G. This relation is an equivalence relation on set S. Uh, equivalence relations are useful, they partition sets, and that's how we'll use this result. For each X in set S, consider G sub X to be the set of all group elements such that that group element G acting on set element X equals set element X um, is a subgroup of G. So this G sub X so defined is a subgroup of G is the claim. In fact, we'll give this a name, we'll call it the stabilizer of X in G uh, any second now. But what we know is these G sub X thing, G sub X things are subgroups. And we know that we can use this, um, this thing here as an equivalence relation. And so we can partition set up S into equivalence classes using this group action ultimately. And let's shrink that a little bit because this is going to give names to what we just saw. Um, we know equivalence classes of an equivalence relation partition a set, theorem 0.4.1 for the record. The equivalence classes given up here uh, under this equivalence relation are called the orbits of G uh, on S. So we take an element X and then we apply all the elements of G to it, getting these other things which are under this equivalence relation equivalent to X. That's called the orbit uh, of X under uh, that type of action. Uh, the orbit is uh, denoted X bar when we've done this before uh, and they're calling it an orbit. It's really an equivalence class. Um, and we've used these bars to represent equivalence classes before. Uh, the subgroup in part two, uh, G sub X is called, I think I mentioned this, the stabilizer of X. Uh, also called a subgroup fixing X, which makes good sense when we look at the definition of it or the isotropy, isotropy group of X. Uh, I'll stick actually with the term stabilizer, although subgroup fixing X seems to make uh, you know, even more sense, but uh, I'll stick with the verbiage stabilizer of X. I think Hungerford pushes that one. Now, um, let's give another example. <clears throat> 
and we're going to give specific examples related to that uh, stabilizer group. And they'll take on specific terms, uh, given the type of group action. We've got uh, conjugacy uh, for one. So uh, consider the following. If a group G acts on itself by conjugation, then the orbit that it would be G X G inverse, such that G ranges over all of group G is called a conjugacy class of X. All right, so it's a, an equivalence class under the appropriate equivalence relation. We saw above, it's uh, an orbit as well. If subgroup H acts on G by conjugation, then the stabilizer group H sub X, that would be the H in this subgroup H, such that H X H inverse equals X itself. Let's look at that. Yeah, that's what we had for the stabilizer. It was um, the group elements that fixed under group action element X. G sub X was exactly that. G sub X, G sub X was the group elements that fix X under the group action. Okay, well down here we're saying the group action is conjugation and we're considering group H instead of group G. So we're looking at uh, H sub X would be the group elements, elements in group H uh, that fix under the group action, which is conjugation in this case, they fix X. Here's the conjugation. We're requiring that equals X itself. Uh, actually, we could uh, take this and rewrite it as uh, HX equals XH, multiply both sides of the highlighted equation on the right by H. So same set of H values here. This is called the centralizer of X in H, denoted by centralizer of X in H. Uh, if H equals G, uh, it's simply called the centralizer of X. It's in the whole group G versus in this subgroup H. So that's why the multiple terminology. Uh, this reminds me of an idea we encountered in um, maybe in the homework uh, when we looked at the center of a group. It's not the center of a group, uh, but it's, it's related to the center of a group for sure. We get, we're getting some type of commutivity in this and that's what the center of a group was. I don't think we stated it in the notes, but it's in the exercises in chapter one. Uh, if H acts by conjugation on the set S of all subgroups of G, then the subgroup of H fixing K, namely the H values, uh, elements of group capital H, such that conjugation H capital K H inverse conjugation of that subgroup equals K, is called the normalizer of K and H. If we take the normalizer of K and G, it's simply called the normalizer of K. So the normalizer of K, that's an example of a stabilizer. The uh, centralizer of element X is an example of a stabilizer as well. So both of these are examples of stabilizers in the more general definition that we had above on the previous page. So we referred to this as the stabilizer, same idea in what we're doing currently, only we've got specific types of uh, group action given here. Theorem 2.4.3 says, uh, if a group G acts on set S, then the cardinal number of X in set S, they're, they're actually sneaking a definition in here, by which they mean the cardinality of the orbit of X, is the index of the stabilizer in group G. Recall the index is a number of cosets, number of left cosets, say, of G sub X in G. G sub X is, in fact, a subgroup of G. That was part of the claim of the first result. So this is a result about stabilizers. And we just had two specific examples of stabilizers. So we'll use this general result in those special settings. Let's look at a proof of that. Okay. So it's a uh, cardinality claim 
cardinality is the same as this index. The index itself is a cardinal number. So we're looking for bijection to establish the equalities of those two cardinal numbers. Uh, let G and H be elements of group G, denote the group action by a star, that's my thing. Then we have G acts on X equals H acting on X. So we get this equality under the group action, if and only if G inverse acting on H, H's action on X is the same as G inverse acting on G's action on X. So right, we said these two were equal, so we substituted in here. Certainly this first, inequal, this first equation implies the second equation. As well, we could uh, take this equation and allow G to act on it from which we get loss of the G inverse and we get that this center equation implies that left equation. And next, um, we've required part two of the definition of group action that these two group actions yield um, G inverse times G, the, the product of these two in the group, then acting on X. But G inverse G, that's the identity, the identity on act, acts on X to give X itself. So we've got um, G inverse acting on H, H is action on X equals H. Well, that means if we rewrite this, that means G inverse times H acts on X to give X out. So G inverse times H in group G acting on X fixes X. That means G inverse H is in the stabilizer G sub X, because that's what the stabilizer was. The stuff that acts on X in such a way as to fix it. Definition of G sub X. Now this is a subgroup. Uh, this property here can be rewritten uh, in terms of, if you like, cosets. Uh, H G sub X equals lowercase g G sub X. Um, I could view this as congruence mod G sub X. Uh, we had dealt with that when we were dealing with cosets extensively, uh, but we get an e equivalence between uh, this G inverse H being in subgroup G sub X and this equality of left cosets, say. So if we want to map a left coset into a group action, and we do, it's well defined. All right, here's what that means. So we've got a left coset. Well, there's a bunch of ways to represent that left coset. Uh, I could use G. That's an element of this left coset. There may be some other stuff that's an element of this left coset as well, like H. But if I use something different, the group action will be the same. If I take two different elements, say G and H, of this stabilizer, they're going to determine the same group action on all elements X. So if we define a mapping in terms of the representative from the coset, which we have, we're okay. It's a well-defined mapping because different representatives produce the same group action. So we want to look at this mapping and ultimately show that we've got a bunch action. Uh, this mapping from the set of cosets of G sub X and G, by the way, there's that many of those. That's what the index is, the number, you know, cardinality of uh, the set of cosets of G sub X and G, left cosets say. And this has mapped us into uh, the orbit of element X. So X has been acted on uh, by all elements of G. If you let G range over all of group capital G, that'll give you all the cosets, and that'll give you all of the group actions as well, give you the orbit of X. The orbit of X is exactly that. So this mapping is a one-to-one -one mapping, uh, also following from the string of implications up here. Uh, a group action corresponds exactly to a coset. That's what we've got with these two-way implications. So this mapping's a bijection. Uh, 
it's one to one. Uh, oh, I skipped the on to part, excuse me, it's on to. Uh, G acting on X is in the orbit of X. Uh, and that's the uh, image of the coset GX. So you pick your favorite thing in the orbit of X, uh, G star X, H star X. That is the image under this mapping of the coset of uh, G, G sub X. Whatever you put there for your particular group action, take the coset with that same thing here. And this mapping gives you the that as an output. And that's an arbitrary element of the orbit of X, an element of X bar, if you'd like. And there's your onto part. So we've got one to one and onto through this mapping. That's a bijection. We're not interested in structure here. We're interested in cardinalities. All we need is a bijection. There's no homomorphism stuff to sweat over. So the cardinality of these two sets are the same. That is the cardinality of the set of left cosets of G sub X and G, the index, equals the cardinality of uh, the set X bar, the cardinality of the orbit of X uh, under this group action. That is the index equals the cardinality and that's exactly what's been claimed up here. Back to the notes. We now consider a special case of action on a set where the action's conjugation, the set's a group, similar to some things we had before. So we're making three claims here. These three claims, <clears throat> not particularly difficult. Uh, let's just look at the greatest hits here. There's a uh, centralizer. But wait a second, centralizers are examples of stabilizers. And we just had something about the index of a stabilizer in group G. Well, that's what this is under a particular group action. Here's another one, a normalizer. The index of a normalizer in group G. Well, normalizers were stabilizers as well under the appropriate group action. So these uh, claims involving the index at the top and the bottom, these will follow from um, the result we just saw, where the stabilizer is a particular thing, because we'll use a particular uh, group action. Let's look at the proof of that. Okay, three claims, break it into three parts, of course. All right. Um, first claim is, well, the statement is, uh, G is a finite group, K is a subgroup of G, the number of elements in the conjugacy, conjugacy class of X and G is the index of the centralizer of X in G, the index of that subgroup in group G. And the claim is this divides the order of G, that divides comment there. That's the reason they made this finite assumption stuff up here. Uh, we'll use Lagrange's theorem in the divides conclusions. So let's see what we get out of that. The uh, centralizer is all G and X such that, let's see, all G and X such that G X, G inverse equals X. So we use the action of conjugation. That can be rewritten in terms of this set here. Just simply cross multiply, oh, excuse me, multiply both sides on the right by element G and that'll produce this equality. Uh, this is a subgroup of G, uh, theorem 2.4.2 part two tells you it's a subgroup because it's it's centralizer. Yeah, I'm sorry, a stabilizer. It's one of those G sub X things that we had in the second part of theorem 2.4.2. Uh, here, it looks like this because the action is conjugation. So the theorem we just saw says the number of elements in the conjugacy, conjugacy class of X is uh, conjugacy class of X as cardinality, um, the orbit this is the orbit as G ranges over G. We know that equals the index of the stabilizer in group G, but the stabilizer is this uh, centralizer. We conjugate, that's the group action, we get X back. X is fixed under conjugation. That's exactly what the stabilizer was. We had uh, the X fixed under the group action in general group action when we were talking stabilizers. Here the group action is conjugation and we're talking uh, centralizers. So Lagrange's theorem tells us the number of um, 
left cosets of this subgroup in G when we're dealing with finite groups is simply the order of G divided by the order of that coset or that subgroup. Uh, so we can express the index in that form. And we made two claims. We claimed a number of elements in the conjugacy class was this index. So we've established that here. And secondly, that the order of that conjugacy class uh, divides G. And here you go. There's the order of the conjugacy class, uh, the cardinality of X bar. And it's, uh, yeah, it divides G. It divides G that many times, cardinality of the centralizer number of times. The third uh, proof will be quite similar to that. Second claim is if X1 bar, X2 bar through X sub N bar are the distinct conjugacy classes of G, they partition up G, remember, uh, they're equivalence classes, then the cardinality of G is the sum from I equals one to N of these indexes. Well, these partition and from part one, the cardinality of these are given by this index value. So that's how the proof of part two goes for the record. Uh, conjugation by an element of G is an action when we treat G as a set. So uh, we know that conjugation um, gives us an equivalence relation. The conjugacy classes then are the orbits under this group action. Uh, so the equivalence classes partition up group G. Again, theorem 0 0.4.1. Usually you're interested in equivalence relations because they allow you to partition sets up. And we just saw that the cardinality of um, the orbit uh, of X sub I, uh, the X sub I bar cardinality was an index. Uh, we had an X here and an X here instead of X sub I's. So just applying it to uh, representatives from each equivalence class and using the previous result. Sum up, and it's a nice clean finite sum because everything's finite and it's just summing up those indices. The third claim, quite similar to the first claim, uh, the number of subgroups of G conjugate to K, so we're taking K as a subgroup of G, as a hypothesis say, is the index of the normalizer of K and G, in G, and the claim that that divides uh, the order of group G as well, same idea. So uh, the normalizer of K was the elements in group G, such that under conjugation, uh, group K is fixed, G, capital K, G inverse equals subgroup K. Uh, that's, a, uh, that's a stabilizer where the group action is conjugation and the set is uh, um, what subgroups of G. Action is conjugation. So same idea, the orbit, the orbit would be um, simply what we get by conjugating subgroup K by all the elements in G. Uh, number of distinct conjugates of K in G, uh, each of which is a subgroup of G. Yeah, we mentioned that before by an exercise. So the number of subgroups of G, which are con conjugate to K is the cardinality of the orbit. If you like, it's a K cardinality of K bar. And again, uh, hey, the normalizer, that's a stabilizer. How big is this conjugacy class? We were told in theorem 2.4.3, the theorem we just did, that it's uh, the index of the stabilizer in group G. But the stabilizer in this setting and this group action is the normalizer of K and G. So theorem 2.4.3 gives us the cardinality of the orbits. It's given by this. Lagrange's theorem tells you, hey, this index can be written as this quotient as long as we have finite groups. We do finite groups. Uh, and again, uh, the index divides the order of G and it divides it that many times. Okay. Uh, this part two of the previous theorem where we've expressed the cardinality of G as a sum of these uh, indexes of centralizers in G, 
Let's just call a class equation of G. We'll see that again. I think it pops up in uh, I think it pops up in the next section. Uh, but for the record, that's called a class equation. Let's do two more results, uh, both of which are uh, not very long. Uh, theorem 2.4.5 says if a group G acts on a set S, then this action induces a homomorphism mapping G into A of S. Remember A of S was the group of all permutations on set S. We can make groups out of permutations on any set. We denoted it A of S. Maybe it's been a while since we did that. But we're using group action and finding a homomorphism that maps groups into these permutation groups from which we'll prove Cayley's theorem as a corollary. Okay, let's look at the proof of that. So uh, again, stars to represent group action. If we take lowercase g and group g, define tau sub g mapping set S to itself by the group action. Take x and map it to g acting on x. We started with a group action, group g acts on set S, and we're looking for this homomorphism. Uh, X equals the identity acting on X. Uh, that's the first part of the definition of group action. We can take the identity and write it as G inverse times G in the group. Let that act on X. The second part of the definition of group action says, well, this should be the same as G inverse acting on the result of G acting on X is given there. So it actually uses both parts of the definition of group action. This has to hold for all X in the set. Uh, the mapping tau of G claim is, is on to, it's given by this particular mapping, take X to uh, G acting on X. Claim is, tau sub G is on to, you pick any X you like, I'll find what tau sub G needs to apply to, to give that X. Tau sub G needs to apply to, uh, G inverse acting on X. What happens? We'll get applying tau sub G, simply takes the G and makes it action on the left. So we'll get uh, G acting on G inverse acting on X. That'll give us the identity acting on X, which is X itself. Exactly what we've got up here. Uh, actually, up here we've got uh, G inverse on the outside and G on the inside. This would interchange the roles, but we could draw the same conclusion. So tau sub G is on to. Uh, uh, so also consider hypothesis straight here. Uh, suppose G acting on X equals G acting on Y. What that implies is x equals g inverse acting on the action of g on x, the little equation we had up here with the g and the g inverse in the same order there. We just assumed g acting on x is the same as g acting on y, so we'll simply substitute that in. Uh, hey, I can get the g and inverse and the g together to give us an identity. This will reduce down to y. It's this equation with uh, x replaced with y, if you like. And so we get X equals Y. That is, if the group action produces the same output, we must have had the same input. In other words, this group action, which we're using to define this tau sub G is one to one. Tau sub G is on to, tau sub G is one to one. Tau sub G maps set S into itself. So we've got a one to one and onto mapping, a bijection from set S to itself. Those things are permutations. A permutation on a set is a bijection on the set. Tau sub G is a bijection. Tau sub G is a permutation. Uh, in other words, uh, tau sub G is an element of this group. The way we've defined the group action here, uh, tau sub G G prime equals tau sub G, tau sub G prime. Think how it would work uh, when we apply tau sub G prime to X, we'd produce uh, G prime acting on X, then apply tau sub G, you'd pick a G up on top of that. You'd group the G prime and the G together using the second part of the definition of group action. And that's the same type of behavior you'd have by applying, applying tau sub G G prime to an element X.
Uh, so this mapping as given here, it's a homomorphism between group G and these permutations on set S, these tau's. The tau's are permutations, the tau's live in A of S. I'm not saying this is an isomorphism, I'm saying this is a homomorphism. Uh, so this mapping that we've introduced here of associating, um, uh, sorry, this mapping, it's the tau sub G's, this mapping of taking a element, element G of group G and associating it with a tau sub G, which turns out to be a permutation. We're mapping elements of G to permutations of set S. Get my story straight. That's a homomorphism. That's a mapping between groups. It's between group G and group A of S. So in fact, it is a homomorphism and that's what we were looking for, a homomorphism between these two groups. And we're gonna prove Cayley's theorem now and it's very dependent on how this ta tau sub G is defined. So that's nice, but this is impressive. Cayley's theorem says if G is a group, then there's a monomorphism, a one-to-one -one homomorphism, that is, mapping G into the group of permutations. Uh, that means every group, whoa, well, every group is isomorphic to some group of permutations because there's no constraints on group G. And this could be, this, this is a group and it's a group of permutations. It's the group of all permutations on set G. Now, set G could be big. It might not be finite, for example. Uh, if set G has cardinality in, if it is finite, then what we're saying is every finite group is isomorphic to a subgroup of S sub N. So there's you some kind of grasp on what finite groups look like. They're subgroups of S sub N. Uh, this tells us all groups, in fact, are groups of permutations. Saying we have a group of permutations is not saying we have a symmetry group. Uh, we're saying we have a subgroup of a symmetry group in the finite case. In the infinite case, we have a subgroup of uh, this thing here, which is a group of permutations. Okay, let the group action be represented by a star. Let G act on itself by left translation. Uh, that is, uh, G acts on X in group G to give us G times X. That's what we call left translation a while ago. We know by the previous result, there's a homomorphism. Tau, say, mapping uh, G into this group here, this group of all permutations. And we saw that element G is mapped to permutation tau sub G, where tau sub G is defined on elements X of the group by the group action. We've taken that simply to be left translation. If tau sub G is the identity on G, then we must have G acting on X, G times X equal to X, the identity. And the only time we get GX equals X for all X and G is when that G is the identity. In other words, if G is in the kernel of tau, G must be the identity. And the only element satisfying this is the identity, the kernel of tau is the trivial subgroup of group G. We do that to show that a uh, homomorphism is actually one-to-one. -one. So if the kernel is trivial, then you know theorem 1.2.3, I guess it was, uh, that tau is one-to-one, -one, uh, monomorphism. So we're trying to say every group is isomorphic to a group of permutations. We just had constructed the homomorphism in the previous theorem here. We've seen that the homomorphism is one-to-one. -one. So we've got a one-to-one -one homomorphism. It's onto something, it's onto its image. Uh, so it's onto some subgroup of A of G. The homomorphic image of a group is in fact a group uh, from chapter one. So whatever the image under that homomorphism is, we've got one-to-one -one and onto that. That's a subgroup of this group of permutations. And there you go. Every group is isomorphic to a group of permutations. Uh, in particular, if um, 
G has finite cardinality, then that group of permutations there is uh, isomorphic to the group S sub n. And that's how we justify this second part of the claim. But that'll do. And uh, let me sing the praises of Cayley's theorem just a little bit. G's a group. Uh, we hadn't seen very many results that apply to all groups. Cayley's theorem applies to all groups. Uh, we saw something related to free groups and quotients of free groups uh, back in around the end of chapter one that applied to all groups, but very rarely do we have a result that applies to all groups. And Cayley's theorem is one of those rare times. Uh, you'd see this in uh, senior level algebra if you uh, happen to go this direction and cover the group action stuff in the senior level algebra class. All right, so we're uh, at least halfway through this section. So let's take a little break and I'll come back and finish it up in the next video. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.